want to build an environment of pursuing curiosity. You know who you are, who you really are. Like <laughs> you are listening to Everyday Educators on 1921 Radio. Everyday Educators, and we educate every day. And just like that, welcome back to the Everyday Educators podcast. I am your host Jeremy here with the always beautiful, always fashionable Miss Naomi. Hey, what's going on there? Hey, how are you? You know, I'm blessed by the best. I'm doing very Amen. well. Amen. Right. And uh, you all can catch us every Saturday at 9 a.m. on 1921radio.com. Also, YouTube and wherever you listen to your podcast, Everyday Educators, and don't forget the S. And please, hit that like and subscribe button. Also, uh, I'm reading my script here on social media. Same thing. Everyday educators, don't forget the S. Now, in preparing for today's episode, a word kept bouncing around in my mind. The word is nourish. And so I looked it up and I would like to share that definition with you. This is from the Britannica Dictionary. You know, we educators here, so we got to cite our sources. Now, nourish means to provide someone or something with food and other things that are needed to live, be healthy, to cause something to grow and develop. Now, I say that so we can do some level setting. So today, we have a storyteller. We have a nourisher. We have a man whose mission is to spread the gospel of West African cuisine, my brother and my friend, Dozy Abikwe. Did I say that right? That's pretty good. That's very uh, good. <laughs> no, no, we, let's get it right. How, how, you, how do you pronounce your last name? I thought I took a shot at it. I mean, that's a great shot. No doubt. <laughs> great shot. <laughs> All right, so Dozy from Dozy's Grill. I'm not going to butcher it. I don't want the Nigerians coming after me, man. <laughs> man, thank you, Dozy, for being on the show today. How you feeling today, brother? I'm doing well. I'm doing great. Thanks for yeah. having me here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All righty, folks. So uh, just for a brief check-in, right? For me, this was a very full week. And it was one of those weeks where, like, I didn't anticipate on, like, how full it was going to be. Right. So if you all could just kind of uh, give me one word to describe your week. How was your weeks this week? Dozy, you go first. You're the guest. Oh, my. Um, <laughs> this week, a blur. 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 All right. Yeah, I could say that. I seen you twice this week and it, and it, it looked like it. <laughs> what about you, Nate? Um exhausted mm, yeah i'm gonna say uh connected I'm, i i may i met i met with and met a, a few new people but it was like all over the place okay so good good so miss naomi Pasita palacios nelson really gotta get the, the, <laughs> had to do the full the full demonstration on a scale of one to ten, I'm not going to ask you, Dozy, because it's, it's your professional. On a scale of one to ten, how would you say your cooking skills are? Rachel, cooking skills. Two. A uh, two? Come yeah. on now. You know, burnt that chicken better than that. Now. <laughs> Come on now. I can make two things. I can make chicken, and I can make um, salmon croquettes. Mm, you know what? Look at you. Uh, and that's growth, Dozy. Let me tell you. <laughs> All right. I'm I'll sure there's 10. Oh, I appreciate that. Yes, they are 10. <laughs> Ask her husband. He he, snap it up. See? See, there you go. Um, I would say a seven and a half. I would say my, again, this is on the, this is, this is like the, if you were rating like G League players, right? So I'm not. I'm not in the NBA rankings. I'm just saying at the G League level, I say I'm pretty decent. Okay. Good. So 
I want everyone to imagine going your imaginative space right now um, and think about taking the cooking class of your dreams. Those that you're going to participate in this one as well. So you're taking a dream cooking class. Who would you want to teach the class? Who would you like to take lessons from? And who would you like to join you? Who's going first? Well, how about you? You, you the chef. So let's. <laughs> well, um, I think when I think on the question, mm -hmm. um, I would definitely want more and more of the culinary nourishing that I got from my grandmother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I remember vividly growing up. You know in our household back in nigeria um as far back as three years old uh after i came home from kindergarten she would have me wash my socks and wash them you know okay and i would help out at home in the kitchen with cooking wow. um for me that's the only culinary education really that i had so i would want more of that and I would definitely want, I think I would invite my friends today to join me so that they can peer into, um, I guess, for me, a past uh, that is difficult to relive, you know, mm. experience again. Well, uh, well, I'm not going after that, Nay, so you got to go next. <laughs> <laughs> um, does that matter? It's just anybody dead or alive? Yeah, yeah. This just okay. you know. Um, I would say in that same vein, I would want to take a cooking class from my great grandmother mm -hmm. because my entire family always talks about her cooking and how good it was and like she would host like all the, the family dinners, she would host Sunday dinners. And so those recipes or those traditions are not there like we still get together but like her recipe recipes and how she fixed things are like we don't do that because nobody knows how to cook like her so i would um uh, want to take classes from her and then i would my mom and her siblings i wouldn't have them do it but like my cousins i would want all of us to do it so that we can make sure that lives on wow wow I don't even want to answer it. I don't. <laughs> um, so I would choose the, what's the, so y'all know Iron Chef, right? I don't, I didn't, I didn't look up his name, but the Asian guy that came from like the original Iron Chef who, who then came onto the American Iron Chef, Morimoto, I think his name is, like the Japanese, yes. the Japanese guy. I would want to, <laughs> I would want him just cause it's like a, a style of cooking who, uh, that I'm not that familiar with. Um, and I'm a bring a, cause we're going to have some good laughs. All right. <laughs> Watch her fumble around in the kitchen. That's accurate. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to, uh, today's actual factual. And we and I wanted to keep it light because, like you said, we all have full weeks, so we're just going to do a, a a light story. And actual factual for those of you who aren't familiar is a segment where we just kind of cover something that's going on in the news and the headlines, and it may or may not directly touch, you know, education. Um, I don't know about you guys and how your algorithms are algorithming, but. My internet has been buzzing because of the latest collaboration that came just in time for the holidays. So, Sister Cardi B, shout out to Barty Gang. I was her first fan of Chicago, but we're going to move forward. Um, Cardi and Miss Patty LaBelle have joined their forces to spice things up for the holidays, just in time for Thanksgiving. Um, I don't know if you know Dozy and everyone else listening. Uh, Cardi B has a liquor infused whipped cream called Whip Shots. What? And if you've been living under a rock, 
Have you have you tasted it? I haven't. Yeah. I've been living under a rock. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, not that part. If you've been living under the rock, I was saying the patty pies. I'm sure you're familiar that Patty LaBelle has patty pies, right? Have you heard of this? Dozy? I've been living under a rock. Oh, okay. Well, see, this is this is for you. <laughs> so Patty LaBelle from the LaBelles and all the you know great music. She is uh famous for her cooking. She started a a line of food products starting with sweet potato pies and they teamed together her and cardi b um, they were interviewed by people magazine and they spoke very highly of one another and how happy they are to combine their culinary forces so if you guys you know out there are looking to have some uh sweet potato pie with some i think she said pumpkin infused whipped cream then go down to your local walmart and try it out and let us know in the comments what you think um but my question for you two age-old debate pumpkin pie or sweet potato pie fight it out <laughs> okay, maybe, I mean, maybe not. Maybe not. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted the drama. I wanted the beef, but I guess maybe, you know, maybe this another podcast. <laughs> Nate, what do you think? What, what's your other two? Um, I'm not huge on pie in general, but if I had to pick one, I'm definitely going with sweet potato pie. Mm, that's the right choice. Dozy. I find sweet potato pies more relatable as well. Come on, with the yams. Wow. Come on now. We know what it is. All right. <laughs> Very good. Everybody who voted pumpkin was getting voted off the island. But uh, <laughs> do you all have a favorite since now you don't like pies? Do you all have a favorite like holiday dessert? Anybody? I will do apple pie with the like the vanilla ice cream. It's not something I like seek out, but when it is available after dinner on Thanksgiving, that's usually what I go for. The Alamo joint. All right. What about you, Dozy? Is there a holiday treats that you look forward to? Holiday treats. Well, it don't have to be American holiday. Well. That's what I say. I didn't want to say like Thanksgiving one, or Christmas. One made well. Mm -hmm. One made well. You know, simple bread pudding. Mm. Simple bread pudding with, uh, you know, well delivered creme anglaise. Mm -hmm. Okay. It can always nourish uh, my soul. There you go. See, that word, nourishment. All right. <laughs> I appreciate you staying on brand. We didn't practice this, but you driving <laughs> it home. I like that. Okay. So, Dozy, we're going to loosen you up right now. This is where you go. Let's do it. You know, just get your creative flu juices flowing. Let's do it. So right now we're going to have a pop quiz. Don't be nervous. And so we're just going to ask you a series of questions. And you whatever first comes to mind, just give us off the top of the dome. All right? Let's do it. All right. Uh, now you ready? Yep. Kick us off. Um. Who would play you in your life story? What actor? Whoa. <laughs> uh huh. Good lord. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought about that. Uh huh. Never thought about that. Um, Just say Idris. We know what it is. <laughs> Wait, does it have to be so unknown? I mean, or... if you want your little brother to play you, that's cool too. Or if you want to play yourself. <laughs> Funny enough, there's a guy in my kitchen currently. Ah, uh, one of my yes, one of my uh, shout him out teammates. His name is Eric. Okay, he looks like Chris Tucker. He does, <laughs> <laughs> Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I didn't see it, but like see him a couple times this week. Definitely look like Chris Tucker. <laughs> yeah, he looks like Chris Tucker. Um, he's someone who's, uh, you know, in a way like me, a lot of stubborn very particular on how he uh, executes things and wants to make sure that it's done well and correctly. And I really, I really appreciate and value that, you know, uh, he's someone who cares and it shows. 
So um, if uh, somebody were to play my <laughs> role in a movie, I think he'd probably do a good job. <laughs> All right. Well, shout out to Eric. Okay. All right. So next question. Describe yourself in one word. Whoa. <laughs> Is that the word? <laughs> hey, come on, hit us with the black rod. Like, whoa. Um, hmm. uh, gosh, good gosh. Come on, why are you asking easy questions? <laughs> come on, man. One word. One word. Um, polyrhythmic. Polyrhythmic. Okay, you're going to pick the one word everyone had to look up. That's fine. All right, Nate, what's next? <laughs> what was your favorite subject in school? Ooh, um, literature. Okay. What is your favorite type of music? Oh, I don't know if that's fair. <laughs> I listen to them all. <laughs> um, good gosh, if I have to pick one. Can I cheat and ask Spotify? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm all over the place in music. Mm -hmm. I told you I'm polyrhythmic. Okay, so but, all right. Well, let's let's pivot. What yeah. uh, what's the last thing you listened to that stood out? How about that? Oh, like the specific song or genre? Genre, just genre. Genre. Um, it would be reggae. Okay. Roots reggae. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Some reggae. Yeah. I was jamming, jamming all night to the same song on repeat last night. Mm, okay. Yeah, coming in from the cold by Pete Tosh. And, okay. Yeah. So you should be able to answer this question here. What is the best concert that you've ever been to? Oh, Oasis. Okay. All right. See? Yeah. Easily. Nice. <laughs> all right. Nice. Easy. Nice. Oasis, 1999, okay. Allstate Arena. Hey. Hey. <laughs> talk about it. <laughs> Nay. Um, uh oh, it was... it's a story. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, you said talk about it. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Oh, no, well, no please. <laughs> please. I was just, you know, advancing the conversation. But if you give us some uh, background for those who don't, who weren't there. Yeah. Well, I was 19 years old. I lived up the street at Halstead and Harrison. Mm -hmm. Harrison. I, I lived in the dorms at UIC. And a band I'd been listening to for about two years or maybe three years at that time, Oasis, you know, I was listening to them in high school and they were having a concert at the Allstate Arena. And, you know, we got tickets and uh, I was so excited. I'd never been to a concert um, before then. Wow. So, of course, I, I threw a party. I threw a party <laughs> in the dorm. That's the only way to do it. Hey, man. That's the only way to do it. Exactly. Yeah. I had some friends help me obtained two kegs for beer because I was 19. There you go. And uh, we staged this in the dorm room <laughs> and bought, you know, <laughs> other stuff, drinks, invited friends over. Okay. Went to the concert, came back, and the party had been busted when we got back. Ah. So, yeah. <laughs> Such is the circle uh, of life. Memorable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Good, good, good. What's next, Nay? One subject you would like to learn more about. What's a what, please? One subject you would like to learn more about. Ooh. Um, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I would, I would think. Um, gosh, let me give that some thought. Can I come back to that question? You come can. Back to All right. All right. <clears throat> What has been your favorite age so far? Your favorite age? 25 was pretty monumental. Mm, 25, yeah. okay. They get them out of purse. Okay, I like 25. Very um, good. 25 was great. If you could have an unlimited supply of one thing, what would it be? Time. Mm. Mm, that's a good answer. Okay. What's one place you like to visit? To visit? Mm -hmm. Meaning I've been there before or never? However you want to answer it. If you want to go back somewhere or if you haven't been there yet? Um, 
I love to travel. So for me, that's a tough one. Um, I can answer the question in a variety of ways. Home is where the heart is. So if I have to name the one Come place, on, I'm about to say it's only one I'm, answer. I'm going <laughs> to where I can, you know, eat that familiar food. There you go. And, you know, smell those familiar aromas and environment. So it'll be Nigeria. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Have you had a lot of events? You know, relative to all that's going on lately, I would say yes. Mm -hmm. And they keep coming at you know, they keep coming at us. I did two events last week. This week I have just one this evening. Next week I have two. And I know there are more uh, coming at me. Wow. Some are high profile, some are, you know, chill, laid back. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, they keep us on our toes and keep us moving. Nice. And keep us, keep us uh, um, accountable for spreading the gospel of Jello. What's your, <laughs> like, what's your ideal number of events? Like two in a week, three in a week? I say five a day. Ooh. Five a day. No one knows this cuisine. And the more we do, the job, the reward for a job well done is more work. Um, mm -hmm. I tell my team. That's yeah, true. Because it's not easy. You know, it's our spaces. Um, it takes a fair amount to uh, success, requires a fair amount of work. Good food. Um, by good people, you know, so a good team. And uh, there are so many elements that comes to creating, you know, food that not only nourishes people, uh, but uh, leaves them with good impression in the moment. Mm -hmm. and, um, fond memories, you know, when it's all said and done. And we have to, you know, what we create has to check off all these boxes. Yeah. Um, you can make great food and serve it to someone who's had a rough day and miss, right? Yeah. You can have, yeah, so you can nail it and still miss because someone's not mm -hmm. uh, in the mood. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I think, yeah, every element of what we do is really important in delivering a good experience uh, for those who experience us. So uh, the more we do, uh, I think is testament to how good um, a job we're doing. I, I just want you to know I'm keeping all of that. That was great. <laughs> yeah. But I think my team will tell you once or twice a week. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a good, it's a good measure. Okay. Well, you know what? I think this is a, uh a good transition into <clears throat> our next segment which is all about brother dozy so right now we're gonna transition back back home as you said as uh our guest last week said back to the continent right we want to know about about young dozy his formative years but first we ask all of our guests if we brought all of your teachers, you know, from your first teacher to the last teacher, if we brought them all into a room, what type of student would they say that you were? This is a question for yep. me? Wow. All the teachers in the same room, what kind of student was I? Um, I think that most of the teachers would say that they enjoyed me being in their class. Um, I wouldn't say that, I, I don't think they would say I was a perfect student by any means, mm -hmm. but I think that they would say they enjoyed my uh, time and presence mm. in their class. I think I was uh, respectful to my teachers uh, by way of, you know, upbringing. Uh, I grew up in a household with parents and 
you know, like I said, grandmom. So in that environment, respect for your elders is um, critical, really important um, in the relationship. And I think I carried that through not just where I grew up in Nigeria, uh, but I know uh, when I got to the U.S. and maybe classroom uh, etiquette was, I would say I observed it was more lax. Uh, the <laughs> teachers here really. <laughs> so, so I don't, I don't want to uh, cut you off, but let's talk about that, right? You are our first international guest, you know, who has experienced school outside of the U.S. and within the U.S. <clears throat> within the U.S. So. Um, you were kind of like hinting on it, but like talk about like those early years, like some of your experiences. And then if you could kind of talk a little bit more about, you know, the differences when you got to the States, like how, how were things different? Sure. Um, I mean, all my life in Nigeria where I grew up and I got here uh, six weeks shy of turning 15 years old. Um, yeah, I came here as a teenager, but all my life through that, I never went to school in multi. You know, you wore a uniform. <laughs> there are standards you have to maintain. Uh, your hair. <laughs> um, like I said, uniform, sandals that were brown in color and polished. Can I ask a quick question? Sorry. Yeah, yes. When you reference hair... Um, are you referring to particularly to like boys, like no facial hair, like you have to be like clean shaven? Correct. You had to maintain certain hair length mm -hmm. um, as a as a boy, and even for the ladies, they had to uh, adhere to certain um, modest. You know, just uh, you couldn't just have your hair anyhow. It had to be well maintained you know, well-kept, combed. You couldn't show up to school with your hair not combed, um, which, you know, there are arguments both ways. When I got to the U.S., on the other hand, I saw massive throws, right, like I saw in the movies, and I'm like, oh, heck yeah. So <laughs> when I got here, I refused to cut my hair. So I grew out a giant fro in the first, you know, 18 months or so. My mom used to threaten to cut my hair in my sleep. She never did. <laughs> she never did. But, um, you know, at some point I got tired of it. I pierced my ear. I wore, I wore uh, non-uniforms to school, and that was normal. Uh, those are obvious um, differences. Uh, but for me, I think conduct, the conduct of students, uh, I saw boys and girls kissing in the hallway in front of teachers. Like, uh, that didn't happen. In me. <laughs> that was not allowed uh, where I schooled in Nigeria, for example. Um, what else? Uh, conduct in the classroom, talking back to teachers, fighting. Uh, those were just not a thing um, previous to being here in the US. Mm. And um, not to tell on anybody, but <laughs> when you got here, where, where did you go to high school? Thornwood High School in South Holland. Okay. All right. Thornwood. All right. Cool, 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 cool. Yeah. District 205. I was about to say, shout out to District 205. Yeah. All right. Thunderbird. Ah, so I was a, a rebel. When I left King, I went to TF South. So, all right. Yeah, we competed against you all in track and field and all those good things. Y'all always lost, we, but it's cool. No, we yeah. whooped you in soccer, yeah. and we showed you who what? who was king in the marching band. Well, it was, it was yeah. listen, not by the time I got there. There's a bit of an age differential, you know? So the Busters, you know, they graduated by the time I got there. So, you know, the real ones, the real ones was there. So, you know, it's cool. It's cool. Everybody yeah. had their time in the sun. <laughs> um, so we're going to bounce around, right? We're going to bounce around. And I want to go back because, again, you kind of talked about it. And I want to say when we first met, I told you I had never tasted your food. But I said, you know, I knew it was going to be good because of the stories that you told. 
and the power, you know, in in that. And then once I once I tasted your food, it was like, ah, I get it, right? So you kind of mentioned it earlier, but you had another form of education, right, in the kitchen. So if you can kind of, you know, talk about, you know, those first times in there with your grandma and maybe what was like the first dish that you you mastered, you know, talk about that. Uh huh. Um, yeah, time in the kitchen with my grandmother um, was definitely critical, and I think shaped my mindset, you know, um, around food. Um, it usually began with a trip to the market, right? We took these walks to the market, greeting everyone on the streets on the way, meeting with the butcher, meeting with the you know person who sold produce buying grains and things like that, um, harvesting from our garden, which was uh, funny enough facing the main road, uh, but you know, it was front facing garden, harvesting from there and creating from scratch. Uh, some of the first things I learned was how to make palm oil from scratch. Yeah, we buy palm fruit, you know, um, roast it, boil it, use a mortar and pestle to pound it, release the palm oil and juices, and, you know, literally process this thing to the finished product, which we then use to begin cooking. And uh, That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got to cook to start cooking. Like, all right, now we can start cooking. I'm tired. Yes. My little hands. Yeah. My little hands are tired. <laughs> Meanwhile, my brothers will be playing soccer. <laughs> but somehow, I obediently obeyed her wishes to remain in the kitchen and continue to help. Um, so, where my grandmother is from is a state called Anambra State in Nigeria. And one of the dishes that they're known for is called Onubu soup. Onubu is uh, bitter leaf uh, soup. It's literally bitter. And to cook it, you have to process the leaves by washing them to take away the bitterness. And uh, those of us who are nutritionists might say, oh, you're losing the nutrients, which is true. Uh, but that's just part of the process of making this soup. It's very uh, tedious, uh, but we use, she uses fresh palm oil. We uh, incorporate cocoa yam, you know, that's boiled and pounded, and that's to help give the soup viscosity. Uh, long story short, when finished, uh, this soup is finger licking, finger licking good. And um, that's probably one of my favorite and proud uh, dishes to create with her with her help. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Uh, so now we go, you know, bounce back. So you're at Thorn Ridge, and you mentioned you went to UIC. Was there any other school that you were like looking into, and what were you studying when you uh, when you got to UIC? I enrolled at UIC. Um, I uh, thought I was going to be a computer engineer. I really enjoyed working with computers. At 15 years old, I could type 60 words per minute. Um, I loved playing Tetris, Solitaire, you know, all the computer games. And just the idea of computers fascinated me. Being on, online through AOL, America Online. <laughs> Um, you know, it fascinated me and I wanted to learn more. Uh, but I realized about three semesters in that I really, really enjoyed uh, hospitality, which was helping me pay for school. Mm. I worked at a place called the Alaton Hotel on Michigan Avenue and uh, interacting with guests mm -hmm. as a bellman, doorman, and concierge. I just um, that allowed my, I think, mindset to uh, get exposed to hospitality and tourism in a way that just fascinated me, and I, I had to follow 
follow my heart. So, so I, uh, I, I want, I want to stop you for one second. So where did that come from? Cause you see, this is the problem when you tell me stories. Cause see, now I use it against you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I know the story, but kind of, cause you know, one hospitality is not a, like the most, like top five, most popular, you know, uh, study areas. Right. And sure. uh, so everyone's, you know, ironically, you know, we had a, a couple of guests ago who was also in, you know, hospitality. But like, how did you get there? Like, where did that, what sparked that interest for you? Because I think that's a powerful story. It just began with a basic need. No. Nah. A basic need for a job. Wait, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I, 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 I'm getting to your question. Okay, all right. All right. Don't cheat me now. It began with a basic need. Uh huh to simply find a job so that I can buy uh, gym shoes and jeans and not have my classmates at UIC laugh at me for wearing slacks and, <laughs> <laughs> and dress shoes to school and ask me if I'm going to church or the mosque <laughs> because of my attire. <laughs> so I had to have some, um, I guess, uh, influence on how I dressed beyond what my parents bought for me. Mm. Yeah. So um, I wanted to buy jeans and gym shoes. <laughs> so I, that's how I got a job in, you know, as a dishwasher in a restaurant in Calumet City. However, um, I, being in hospitality, you know, I just, I don't know, I had, I found that I really enjoyed making people uh, creating fun experiences yeah. for people. And I also did well, I would say monetarily, um, from working in the industry. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. um, as a busser, I was earning as much as the OK servers. And when I was a server, you know, I said turning serving the day I turned 18. I enjoyed it so much. I would say I made pretty good money for an 18 year old. You know, um, for context, I dined at Chicago Chop House um, at 18 years old. I went there and spent 200 bucks. Yes, on flex dinner. on them. Let them go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> spend that on dinner. You know, I didn't have any other bills to pay, so it was easy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, while in, I'm sorry, I'm driving. You guys are going to edit this out, right? <laughs> no, no, go ahead. <laughs> He's like, what is he talking about? No. Um, fast forward in uh, working at the Alatin Hotel, working as a concierge um, in hospitality just allowed me to see the hospitality space mm -hmm. in all facets, fall in love with it, you know, engage with various tiers, whether it be um, travel, whether it be lodging, the meetings, events. You know, I found it fascinating. I really did. Yeah. Um, you know, and as a concierge, we're invited to have so much experiences that are rich. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just was, you know, drawn to that. Uh, however, it was also financially rewarding. You know, like I said, um, mm -hmm. I enjoyed my time. So now you're here. You know, you're spending two hundred dollars on a meal. You got a couple dollars in your pocket. You're working, um, and and then you start moving up the ranks at the at the hotel, right? And that business, yes. right? Um, yes. And then you pivot. What, what you pivot into? Uh, you know, restaurants. Like how? What was? How was that experience for you? Well. Um... <laughs> you did see, you, you did use the P word pivot, and a pivot is fast. Oh, right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> was it like a slow, and, a slow merge? A slow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, you know, I in hospitality, I began in the food space, and I transitioned to the lodging side. But while within the hotels, they also have food elements within. So I never truly 
left the food side, but I was rooted, you know, I would say more grounded on the lodging uh, side of things. But that pivot began to happen, I would say, uh, when I finished college, I moved to, um, I actually lived with my brother. I moved with my brother in Dallas and um, I got to get reconnected with cuisine from Nigeria, mm. right? Um, I ate Nigerian food daily and got re-addicted to the flavors. And when I moved back to Chicago a year later, I began seeking it out. And it was from seeking out, you know, these experiences that I then began to uh, observe a fair amount of gaps in West African cuisine. I used to frequent every Monday a restaurant on Clark Street that served Nigerian cuisine. It was a mom and pop style restaurant. They had acquired, you know, a liquor license, very busy uh i would say corner but the restaurant was seldom visited by those who lived worked and played in the neighborhood um it was however well patronized by nigerians and west africans and um you know at some point the owner asked me to help him take their operation to the next level and in doing so i just observed some gaps and saw that there were big, um, I would say, uh, opportunity for more um, operators, you know, to express themselves in addressing the gaps that lie in the West African food space. And that's when I began thinking of perhaps contributing my version of a solution in the space. Mm. So the the question that I have for you was um, if you can speak to some of the highlights and the lowlights of like owning your own restaurant and it, you know, over time having to take different forms, um, particularly, you know, we have uh, young people and people who are working with young people who, you know, may be interested in doing what Dozy's doing today? <laughs> um, well, highlights, lowlights, um, they're all part of the journey, I think. Um, of course, when we have a vision and a dream, we it's natural, I think, to think of that desired outcome. Um, Oftentimes, that's a highlight, high point, you know, something we celebrate. But in the journey, in the journey, whether or not we prime our minds for it, um, oftentimes there are low points, there are challenges, difficulties that must be overcome. They must be overcome right, to actualize the goal, the dream. And um, I think uh, having, maintaining a growth mindset, you know, maintaining a growth mindset, um, keeping an eye on the prize um, is really important. Mm -hmm. um, in our journey so far, you know, Dozy's Grill, it's something that I registered five years ago, then launched right in the middle of the pandemic, November 21st, 2020. It's almost so, your anniversary. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's, uh, I think we're 10 days away from our third year anniversary. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you, Nate. So that means I got to come back for the anniversary dinner. You have to. There we go. <laughs> you have to. Some suya steaks. We can make it happen. <laughs> Shrimp suya. <laughs> Shrimp suya. So, um, we, it's about to be our third year 
and we finally, finally are in a home. We've been operating out of Crockett Cookies Food Hall for the past four weeks. We just concluded four weeks yesterday. Um, so even though we've been existing and spreading this gospel from south side to the north side to the west side to downtown Chicago, and drawing people from not just the Midwest, you know, we have people driving from Wisconsin, Indianapolis, Michigan to come experience our cuisine. Um, we also see people come from East Coast, New York, Boston to stay in the hotel, the high place um, right above us, stay the night here so that they can experience Dozy's Grill. Uh, these are some of the highlights that after three years of hard work, um, we are proud to share and you know um, be a part of. Mm -hmm. And we definitely look forward to you know doing more, doing more in making the cuisine accessible not just to those who are locals here in Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, but to visitors from all corners of the world. Um, staying on this and not to reveal you know all all of the challenges but i do want to kind of again key in so that you know hopefully someone else will have uh more resources when they you know uh are experiencing their low lights right so what would you say and you spoke about a growth mindset right but what would you yes. say would be like a resource or some resources that you use to kind of like get through and problem solve and and you know endure and thrive and all the things you know during those low light periods um i would definitely uh highlight finding a tribe you know getting to know you <laughs> getting to know you has allowed me to get to know Nate, and getting to know you has um, perhaps uh, strengthened my relationship with Craig Stevenson. Um, getting to know you allowed me to deepen my relationship where we met at Gildro, you know, which is a co-working mm -hmm. uh, club space. Uh, so finding that tribe, uh, finding a mentor. Finding a mentor, I think, is critical, crucial. Um, it's, it's, uh, I would say, almost like uh, therapy, <laughs> because there are <laughs> there are days when even family mm -hmm. <laughs> may not be there for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, you know who understands your why, uh, someone who understands. Um, how important this dream is to you, who's always by your side when you're winning and when you're failing, <laughs> because we need support. You know, um, when it's great, we need support when we are not doing so great. Um, I've had, you know, days that I would say are regrettable. <laughs> I've had 5 a.m. mornings in the kitchen, you know, working till 5 a.m and still feeling like uh, maybe from a revenue standpoint, you fell short. But well, having someone who can root for you, guide you, uh, you know, make sure you stay accountable, I think is crucial. Yeah. Um, yeah, so good relationships, you know, um, is really, really important. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, now, I absolutely love your cooking. And I'm glad you have somewhere where I can go and get some gel off whenever I want to. So I, I appreciate that. Um, but also, like I stated earlier, in getting to know you and understanding that why it has uh, created even more purpose um, in the meal, right? And so particularly as being a black man, and wanting to 
always seek opportunities to like deepening my connection to like the broader diaspora, right? Um, I would like for you to share like in your words, like what is special and unique about West African cuisine um, or and or like what uh, experience would you like for your guests to walk away with? Gospel time. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, cuisine from West Africa nourish me um, from before I was born, right? We get nourished from the source. You know, when we're in the womb, we're being nourished. Mm -hmm. And I was nourished uh, in my culture, Amibu. In my culture, uh, we say Neka, Mother is Supreme. And I was nourished by my mom while I was in her womb. When I came out, I was nourished not just by her, but also by her mom. She, her mom instilled, uh, you know, from memory, you know, uh, being in the kitchen from childhood was with my grandmother because my mom was at work. Mm -hmm. uh, and my grandmother was there when I came back from kindergarten mm. and had me help her, support her, you know, in making meals for the household. Um, so in other words, you really didn't have a choice. You better <laughs> Well, <laughs> we are, I grew up in a culture where <laughs> you had to obey. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> what I was saying is what you're doing now, you have been you know, responding to this calling since back then. That's what I was saying. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And 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 with 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 uh, with joy and pride, right? You know, um, like I said, I chose complete engineering. I chose a different, you know, uh, future, and came back full circle to hospitality. And of course, in expressing it from my viewpoint. I chose the food space to begin. Um, so yeah, um, would you refresh me with that question again, Jeremy? No, no, no. So I mean, <laughs> I was. I'm creating more edit work for you. I'm not editing this. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> you better be. <laughs> no, no, no. So again, the the whole point is, like, you have a personal why, right? But I think yes. the broader why as for like what is it about west african cuisine you know i'm wasn't there you know i'm not from nigeria i'm not from ghana i'm not from these other west african countries but there is something special and unique about it right and you communicate that through the dishes that you share with us and someone who is you know siphoning through the myriad of culinary choices in Chicago or wherever they're listening from, you know, has an opportunity now to be like, oh, I want to seek that out because I want to walk away with X because you're looking for your guests to walk away with a certain experience, which is nourishment, which is, you know, whatever else it is that, you know, I'm asking for you to share, like, what do people want to walk away with so that they can then choose if they are looking for that kind of experience to have, you know, at their local yes. West African uh, dinery. Understood. Well, I think that the biggest problem, um, what we do, what I do, what I do um, is to just spread that gospel of Jalof, to guide people to have access to West African cuisine. So Jeremy and Nay, I learned about almost 17 years ago that the average person in the city, whether they're locals or visitors, cannot name an African restaurant, even if they've experienced it. 
and usually when they can, they can touch on uh, cuisine from East Africa. They find it more relatable. Mm. And specifically, they tend to name Ethiopian restaurants. Um, my observation is probably because it fits the romantic experience for cuisine from Africa. Mm. Ethiopian cuisine, as we know it, uh, particularly in the West, um, is usually you know the one format group dining, you know, injera bread on a big platter with the stews that you pick up and enjoy with friends. And I think the average American finds that easily relatable. However, you know what? I just realized it's like Africa, it's like uh, Ethiopia pizza. It's like you, <laughs> it's like that same communal sure. experience in that way. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, cuisine from West Africa is so mystified. We find it so mystic. People go to these restaurants. There are about 25 West African restaurants in the city of Chicago. Really? Because, yes. I've been home in a little bit, but I didn't know that. That's that's good. More than I thought. So I'm excited Correct. about that. And the Ethiopian restaurants that do more of the volume and revenue, they don't uh, number as much. Maybe at most half. Mm -hmm. 10, maybe 15. Mm -hmm. At most. But they do more volume. They do more revenues. They are people, the average person can name them, even if they haven't been. Mm. Um, the first African restaurant in the city of Chicago is Nigerian restaurant. They build themselves as African cuisine. Uh, so what I found was that West African cuisine, which nourished America, which helped define cuisine that we know as American cuisine today, it's little known on its own and little acknowledged in its uh, influence in what we know today as American cuisine. And I've made it my mission, life mission, that's all I want to do, is to do my part in helping guide people by providing access to this cuisine, you know, West African cuisine by offering it in a way that's demystified, accessible, affordable, and relatable. Um, that's what my brand, Doses Grill, stands for. Um, that's what we've been doing. That's what we've been doing since 2018 when I registered the company. Even before then, I used to host parties in my you know, apartment, invite friends as many as 70 of them and have food have music and have them experience the culture and as i got positive feedback and people wanting to uh, participate in these gatherings um, i knew that we were onto something and that's how we arrived at what is today doses grill um can the, i oh sorry go ahead no please ask i was gonna ask though the period from 2018 to 2020 was that like you like hosting parties in your apartment or like just like putting ideas together or was did you start the register the company and be like never mind i don't want to do that and then in 2020 you got back to it like what was that like two-year gap like yeah um it actually the parties began before they went as far back as 2011. yeah oh wow <laughs> yeah the house parties go as far back as two, 12 years ago. Mm. And UIC house party legend. Come on now. Oh, UIC parties were 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> 22 years ago. <laughs> but um, the house parties were, you know, in 2011, I lived in Logan Square. And we'd have people over and, you know, showcase Nigerian food, music. I had a band, I had an Igbo band. So we would play live music and or have a DJ, you know, entertain. And people just from all cultures loved it. So we did more and more. Um, 
closer to 2018, I was actually doing pop-ups. You know, mm -hmm. I would cater for friends who were, you know, I catered for a couple who were just affianced at the time, for example. And I ended up doing their baby shower, the daughter's first birthday, and I actually did their her third year birthday a few months ago. So uh, in 2018 is when I just registered the company so that I could find a space. I actually mm -hmm. found a space and signed a lease. Nay, I, <laughs> I went with very little resource. I signed a lease um, at a place on the south side. The kitchen was cheaper than I paid less for a commercial lease than I paid for where I, you know, my, where I, where I stayed, my mm -hmm. residential lease. Um, I took my time working on renovating the space mm -hmm. so that I could open um, within a year. Like I, I planned out an entire year of paying lease and doing renovation work to open my restaurant. And um, of course, as I was preparing to open, the pandemic hit. <laughs> the mm -hmm. pandemic hit. And the landlord gave me an out. He asked me if I wanted to exit the lease. And I said, yes, I will. Thank you. And um, I exited, but I, I knew that I, I didn't want to stay committed, not knowing what the outcome would be with COVID. Yeah. Uh, but then I jumped in in 2020 because cloud kitchens, you know, ghost kitchens were a thing. Mm -hmm. So I signed up with a ghost kitchen that was sort of, you know, a month-to-month -month arrangement. And that felt more comfortable, more turnkey. And that's how we launched in 2021. Nice. Mm. Okay. That's around when we met. Yeah, that. Um, so in our closing question, right now, there is a, a young person who might be picking produce in their grandmother's front facing garden, right? You know, learning those preliminary knife skills and all those wonderful things, who is looking to spread the gospel of the food of their culture, right? And I would like for you to provide uh, a piece of advice for them something that they can use to get started today uh, that will help them have their own version of Dozy's Grill in the future. Mm. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> it's hard. It's very difficult. Very difficult. Don't do it. That's what we joke and say. But if you must do it, if you must do it, don't do it because it's not easy. But if you must do it, if you must do it, um, make sure that you are in touch with the reason why you want to do it. Make sure that it's a cause that is you are not willing to turn your back on. And I would say equally important is, you know, so back to my first point, make sure it's really important. I had access to West African cuisine. I made the cuisine myself. I grew up in a household and still have, you know, friends, restaurants where I can go and access this cuisine. But having been here as long as I have and having the sort of network that I do and knowing that my friends couldn't tell me one West African restaurant. My nephews and nieces, they know them, but they don't like to go to them because, right, the way I grew up enjoying our cuisine, it's not the way they like to enjoy it. So what I do, what I create embodies um, a an ikigai, for lack of a better word, of, you know, we, we in creating Dozy's Grill, we created a space where people like myself who grew up with the cuisine 
you know, the way my grandmother, my mom's mom, you know, grew up with it. That's how I learn. And I make it in a way that I enjoy it. And I make it in a way that you, Jeremy, can relate to it. And they, if you dared to come through to 1811 West Harrison. I'm there. As soon as I get home, like, I have a list. Of, it's funny how through the podcast, my list of restaurants when I come home have changed. That's right. <laughs> The stuff what? I would normally hit, I'm not hitting when I come home. Good, good. So, Cause can you name can you name one African restaurant? The only one that I know, and I don't even know if they're still open, is Yasa. They are. Yasa is still open and thriving. You know. Good. That's good to hear. Thank you for knowing them. Uh, but of course, there are many more, right? Mm -hmm. And Yasa is doing a great job. Uh, but you know, I find that. You know, your experience should, you know, with Yasa should hopefully provoke more interest in seeking out other West African restaurants, right? And um, that's that's what we, you know, try to create for our guests, for our audience. Mm -hmm. um, so a place that I like, a place that my friends like yourself will enjoy a place that my nephews and nieces can go and enjoy cuisine the way that they, you know, that they like. Um, that, that to me is what it's about. Mm. Okay. Well, we got to go on tour, man. I need you to put me on some of these other restaurants. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. So I, I'll be honest with you. I have a, uh, I don't want to say I have a problem, but that's kind of negative reinforcement. But if it's like, if Dozy's Grill is open and I want Jollof Rice, I'm not going nowhere else. <laughs> I will only choose the alternative if you were closed. Like if sure. it was a Sunday, I'm like, all right, well now I could go somewhere else. Sure. Um, so yeah, you gotta, we gotta, we gotta go out to some of these other spots. Um, yeah. So we also are all, you know, avid readers. And, you know, for the, our audience who may be looking for some books to add to their collection, I will ask you, what is the greatest book you've ever read? And what is the last book that you read? And we, we honor audio books here. So if you listen to it, it counts. Hmm. The greatest book I've ever read. Greatest book. And the last book I've read. Last book. I love reading. I grew up being um, a bookworm, bibliophile, blah, blah, blah. Um, if I have to choose the one book, it would be a book called The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. Mm -hmm. It's easy okay. to read. Uh -huh. I think one can devour the entire book within two hours. But I think the wisdom within the book um, is at first, it's, it doesn't seem new. It seems like all those things your parents, you know, uh, reinforced at a young age. But uh, when I read the book with understanding, you know, I find that the more I read it, the more I take away. I've read it no less than probably a hundred times. And I, yeah. <laughs> no, Craig, Craig has mentioned that book a few times. I, yeah. I haven't picked it up yet, but OK. Oh, I'll send you a copy. Ah, see, they, look at that. Fresh air. Yeah. Fresh I'll send you a copy. So your copy is spoken for. Um, you'll text me your address now. I'll have it sent to you. But the prophet no. is... No, no, no. You ain't going to cheat me. You're going to bring it to Dozy's Grill and I'm going to show up. <laughs> Heard. I'll have it here next week. I'll let you know what day to say. Yeah. Now, if, I, if I'm going to eat it, I can't eat it over no jollof. <laughs> actually, <laughs> actually, last time I went, when I went, uh, went, when I brought Craig there, I got the rice and stew. I like that. That was, you know, that was good. Thank you for good. putting me on that. Of course. Um. So that's a wrap, y'all. Right. I want to thank everybody who's listening um, for going on this journey with us. And definitely, definitely thank you, Dozy, for sharing. Um, please, final thoughts and let everyone know. I know you dropped the address before, but formally, 
let people know where they can find you uh, in person and online. You can find us online at dozysgrill.com. That's D-O-Z-Z-Y-S-G-R-I-L-L.com. Or simply just Google us. But when you do, our physical address is 1811, that's 1811 West Harrison Street. We are in Crockett Cookies Food Venue in the Old County Hospital. Um, I appreciate and thank you, Nay and Jeremy, for having me on your podcast. And uh, thanks for giving us the space to uh, bring to light West African cuisine to your audience. Uh, thank you. Yes, thanks for being here. Thank and, you. and all my educators out there, till next time, keep teaching, keep learning, and keep loving y'all. Peace. Bye bye. All right, see, that's, that's it, man. It. <laughs>